Welcome back to Adam Soratari Extreme. We all need a break from the fuel system. So what we need to do is move over to the engine. That is a little bit more exciting. And there are a lot of you that already know a lot about it. But there are also a lot of you that want to learn about it. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on. First of all, since the, the engine has been sitting for over 15 years, everything is dry. There may be a small film of oil on the bearings, but there's not gonna be much in there. So the first thing I did was I changed the oil. When we go through that, it's very simple in this vehicle. I'm sure all of you can figure that out. What I did was, is usually I run when we're racing Mobile One 1550. But because I want the oil to go through the system as fast as possible and get to the bearings, I loaded it with 530. Anytime you have a race engine, the RX-7, the NSX, we always prime the system. Now the advantage to an external dry sump pump like the NSX is we can turn it with a hand wrench and oil the system and fire. The RX-7 still uses a factory oil pump, so we have no way to access it. So anytime any engine is sitting and it doesn't have an external pump, what I recommend doing is disconnecting the ECU, pulling the spark plugs, because even if you don't light it off, you still have compression. So if you pull the plugs, you reduce the load. And we'll kind of go through all that right now. And then we'll compression the RX-7 engine and see what condition it's in. And I have not compressioned it, so I don't know. As you know, we turned it over <clears throat> and everything went fine. Now, a lot of you with a lot of experience are probably asking yourselves, or at the time were asking yourselves, why didn't Adam just compression it then? Well, two reasons. One is the battery was completely shot. So I had to order the special dry cell battery that it uses. Yes, in the newer cars, the new way, lithium ion is the way to go, but we're kind of just restoring the RX-7 to the way it was. So I had to get the same exact Odyssey battery, which was cutting edge at the time. But for all of you that are building all these project cars that want the best stuff, and I even plan to do it to all my cars, lithium ion with the internal regulator is a huge weight savings. So the other issue that I came across was the starter didn't work a very common problem with ag equipment. So for those of you that don't know this trick, especially for a car that's been sitting a long time, the brushes tend to hang up, the drive doesn't get contact. So our trusty friend, the dead blow hammer, give it a few hits with this on the body. Just make sure you don't hit into the solenoid area and actually where the drive motor is itself. And you may get lucky and it frees up. That worked on this and it works all the time on farm equipment. The problem being with your everyday car is it probably isn't hanging up. The brushes are probably getting close to worn out. So if you use that trick on your regular car, be warned that you have a very small window of time before you would want to definitely replace the starter. So that being said, there was something interesting that came across when I changed the oil. When we were running this seven, I would change the oil after every race. I believe I didn't change the oil this time, but either way, just something to look at real quick here. I say the oil because usually the oil would come out looking pretty good. Now, granted, it's been sitting for quite a while, but if you look at that, that pretty much looks like a farm tractor diesel oil change, not looking good. So I am definitely glad that I took the few minutes to drain and change the oil. As I was talking about for the compression test, the first thing we wanna do is remove the plugs. So I'm gonna reach down here and see if I can't pull them out real quick. Okay, now that the plugs are out, what we'll do is clean up just a hair here because we're going to the interior and I always try not to mess anything up. I'll need to go ahead and unglove. In any which way you want to do it, I prefer to just disconnect the ECU, which in case you didn't know, this car runs on an M4, Motec. I'll disconnect that, that way there'll be no ignition running. Okay. And also fuel pump, everything. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pick it up. Take a quick look here. Here it is. I'll slide the boot back. It has been quite some time since I've removed one of these. All right, there we go. We will just set that aside. Now we know we're disconnected. So all the engine management is not operable at this point in time. 
as we work towards charging the oil system, some things to point out, especially for you guys that are doing it for the first time. You want to take a visual and make sure that everything's clear of anything that's going to move, especially in the dry belt area. Just make sure nothing's going to get sucked in. Whether or not you're just cranking or even starting, always check the inlet to your turbos. There's been a lot of people, friends I know, in the mad rush, you just kind of forget and things go really bad. The other thing is, recall that we put lubricant into the combustion chambers. Well, that is all going to come out with the spark plugs out. So do yourself a favor, whether or not it be a rotary or a piston, lots of loose rags. That way when all that comes out, there's something to catch it, it'll save you a tremendous amount of cleaning time. Usually we're not doing this with the intake manifold open, but since I wanted to jump forward, we have to do that. The one thing we need to keep in mind is don't stuff the rags into the intake manifold, anything that's open, just leave it loose so it won't get sucked in. That's the key. When they're jammed in there, they can get pulled in. All right, with all that being said, battery charger. It's really important to keep the voltage up, especially because you're going to be cranking. We're going to charge the system. We want it to be consistent. And on top of that, we're going to be doing a compression check and the voltage needs to be consistent to get consistent readings. Let's go over to the car itself. Inside, I've set up a dowel to depress the clutch pedal and I've got my trusty little friend, this little pillow there, set it all up. Yes, I know it doesn't look that super professional, but Obviously, we're just going to do this real quick to get it to work. So if you look over here, we've got the oil pressure gauge there. I'm going to hit the start a few times since it's been sitting forever just to make sure everything's free. Okay, everything seems good. Let's go ahead and crank it and see if the system will charge. There she goes. All right, we have good oil pressure. So we'll shut this system off. And what I'll go through now is what we need to do to prepare to do the compression check. It's pretty obvious the main thing you're gonna to need to do the compression check is a compression tester. As always, I typically use a snap-on, but to be honest with you, you're just reading pressure. These are pretty pricey, so you can pretty much get away with using any one that works for you. It just needs to be fairly accurate, especially on the rotary. It's really the trained eye, and you'll see when we do the test what you're looking for, and I'll explain that to you. But what you wanna do is, when you're testing a piston engine, the compression tester always has a Schrader valve. Okay, so as it pumps, it builds pressure. When you're gonna do a rotary, you need to remove it. That way you're reading each combustion chamber individually. Remove it, set it aside, for ease of operation, this goes in on its own and then quick disconnect coupler for the gauge itself. What we need to do on the seven or any rotary for that matter, with 13B, you wanna put the leading plug in, which in this case would be the lower plug. If you have any question on that, it is indicated on the rotor housing. So you put that plug, snug it down so it seals, then your compression tester goes on the top, and we'll go ahead and move to do that now. Okay, let's pull the rags out. That helped us from making a mess. And with that, everything is looking pretty good. All right, so we'll take the leading plugs and send them back in. Okay, leading spark plugs are in. We'll go back over here. We'll grab the attachment to put in the trailing. Let's see here, let me get in here. Now, we'll take a rag and put it around this end so we don't mess up the paint.
Okay, all right, let's grab the compression gauge. Now, typically, there's a detent or release valve. This is non-functional on the rotary, but for those of you on the piston engine, once you crank and it comes up, push the valve, releases the pressure. Careful with the gauge. We'll just slip it down right in here, hook it up, wipe it clean first. Now that we're in position to start the compression test, you always want to double check the battery charger. I see we're at 100% and we want to stay consistent with that. Now, as I explained before, the train die and the rotary, the difference being is, is that each pulse as a rotor comes by is measured on the gauge. So the main thing you're looking for is consistency. Now, I can't recall exactly how much compression this engine was making because it's been 20 years ago, but I can tell you that if you see the pulsing coming up and one is lower than the others, or two is lower, that's a good indication that we've hurt something. In most cases, one being lower is a side seal, two lower is usually an apex seal or a corner seal. A minor deviation, corner, big deviation, apex. So we'll go ahead and have the, my assistant crank it and let's take a look. Go ahead and hit it. Okay, good. All right, so what we saw from that is all the pulses were consistent. They were hitting 75 pounds. So the engine is probably okay, at least in the rear housing. The compression in my recollection seems a little bit low, but let's go ahead and check the front for comparison and see what we get. With the compression tester hooked up to the front housing, we're ready to give it a whirl. Of course, we want to confirm we've got 100% on the battery. Actually, I let it sit there a while to make sure it's topped off. So now we'll do the same thing. We'll go ahead and run it and see what it does on the gauge. Remember, what we're looking for is even pulses. Hit it. Okay, good. Now, again, even though it's been 20 years, I've got quite a bit of experience watching these things. I don't know if you guys took notice, but what I saw was one of those pulses are weak. So I've got two that look like good pulses running close to 75 pounds. If my eyes aren't playing tricks on me, I'm pretty sure that one of the pulses was near 60 pounds, plus or minus. So what I'll do is I'll run that back in slow-mo so you guys can take a good look at it and we'll see actually how close I got. All in all, it's been a very good day. I'm really excited because we actually got to run the compression test, which I know just like you guys, I did want to see what the results would be, but I did have to rectify the other issues. And on top of that, I'm sure most of you probably heard, it sounds like I'm losing the starter solenoid. So that of course is more work. And when I was down there hitting the starter with a dead blow just to make sure it would run, I did notice also that the lower bolt is stripped. So be as for budget. You know what I'm talking about. And I know you love to hear all these great things. Unfortunately, misery loves company and that's how these things go. But the good thing is, is that at least the engine is operable. Even with that combustion chamber lower, it'll be fine. The car will run. I've run with 55 pounds of compression before and still run in the eights. So I think we've got plenty of things going on here. Some information for all of you and I know you love the information on the engine. Three hits. Three combustion chambers per rotor housing. One was down on the front. My guess, I'm not a genius, but maybe a side seal. Because what you want to realize is, if there's problems on the irons, it's consistent with every hit. If it's two of the hits, possibly an apex seal if it's major. If it's very minor, most likely a corner seal. Again, let's think about this. It's been sitting for 20 years. The other side of this is, is that it could just be stuck a little bit. And after running, it may loosen up and it may bounce back up to around 75. Who knows? We won't know that till we actually try and run it. For those of you that think we're over the hump, think again. I am quite sure that I'm gonna run into so many problems, it is gonna be pure insanity. But 
All you can do is keep a positive attitude and keep moving forward. Otherwise, you'll never survive in projects like this. So we'll continue on. The information I transposed onto you for the rotary should help all of you, whether it be street cars, race cars, even a lot of the procedures will translate to a piston engine. Of course, you would put the Schrader valve back in the compression gauge. I know you like to all learn from my experiences. Well, it doesn't get any better than this. On that happy note, for all of you that stay to the bitter end, I have some good news. I had a chance to have a conversation with Christian and he is moving forward to do an interview with me. He's just trying to figure out how it fits into his channel. And he's gonna handle that information that comes from when I started racing to when I stopped. Now, Rami, the rest of you that have been on me to give you that special video on what I've been up to after I've been racing, here's your opportunity. Comment below with your questions and I'll handle that here on my channel. I will put together a video just for you guys fielding your questions on what I've been doing since I finished racing. And hopefully that will satisfy and take care of all of you. So on that happy note, I'll see you all next time.